sound like. <laughs> uh, but I'm here with you all today. So my presentation kind of stems from an interesting experience that I had in Quito, Ecuador uh, in the summer 2018, um, where I was kind of understanding how urban and rural health care um, differed um, in, in Ecuador. And interestingly, um, I did a little uh, literature study upon returning where I was interested in uh, obesity and childhood obesity and how, uh, I guess, policies were being implemented in order um, to kind of combat childhood obesity. And quickly I realized that most of the policies were population-based. They were based um, in schools um, and there was a lot of, I guess, fiscal measures that were being implemented. But I didn't see a lot of, I guess, uh, literature to support that the role of physicians was changing in terms of how to respond to childhood obesity. Were there being new techniques implemented? Were, were physicians being trained to counsel in a different way? Um, so those are the questions that I had in my mind immediately upon returning. Um, and I kind of uh, figured that it would be a good research inquiry, and that's what brings me here today. And I'll kind of direct on why I ended up choosing Chile as, as a potential destination for that. Um, but in order to set the stage a little bit, I need to set some definitions. Um, and that first being childhood obesity or obesity in general, which is defined as abnormal or excessive body fat, abdominal body fat. Um, and it's usually measured by BMI or body mass index, which is a measure, um, or which is measured by uh, taking one's weight in kilograms and dividing it by one's height in meters squared. Um, that's all to say that this is the average um, range or this, this is the range of or standards or cutoffs. Um, if you're familiar at all with BMI, it's likely in the context of this, and that's representative of the standard adult cutoffs. Um, so a person with a BMI of about 20 kilograms per meter squared is well within the normal or healthy weight range. However, this uh, kind of standard is not applicable, ac applicable to children. Um, and instead, there's a number of centile curves out there that is used to kind of direct physicians, clinicians, and social scientists as to kind of the norms. And that's primarily because of two reasons. One being that uh, BMI varies drastically with age due to the development early on in life. Um, and it also varies between sex, between male and female um, throughout development. So here I have pictured for you two curves for, uh, developed by the World Health Organization, updated last in 2007. Um, and this represents BMI for um, boys and girls between the age of five and 19. And again, the kind of point, the, the fact that they can differ along age, that average or the normal of 20 that I presented to you, if you take a look at the girls chart, for example, and you look at, uh, let's say, a six-year-old girl right here, and you track up to the 20th, uh, 20th BMI, that's considered obese um, in children at that age. However, if you track to, let's say, 15, and you go to that same point at 20, uh, a BMI of 20, uh, it's considered well within the normal range, and it falls about here. So that's an important consideration and why uh, centile curves are kind of used um, in, in terms of the analysis of one's overall uh, healthiness determined by their BMI. There are a number of different curves out there. Uh, I prefer the World Health Organization's curve as opposed to the CDC, just in terms of the reference um, populations that were used. Um, and then there's also another curve that's commonly used um, from the International Obesity Task Force. Um, they, 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 like I said, they, they differ in terms of the populations used or reference used. Um, and also may have different cutoff values. In general, I, I think we've all heard a lot about the growing rates of childhood obesity and obesity in general, and I think these maps do a good job of pointing to two things um, that I'm interested in. The first being that um, if you look at the curve to the left, which represents obesity rates between the age of five and nine around the world, um, Chile is pretty comparable to the United States. 22.7 for the United States, 18.7 for Chile. And I know for most people that's pretty surprising because you don't expect a South American country to have the same problem that the United States would have. In addition, looking at the same graph, there's also a lot of variability around the world, um, indicating, or indicated by you know, Chile at 18.7, and if we look at a country such as France, 10.4%, and then if we look at a Pacific Island country like uh, Nauru at 36.3%, um, all the way to the right of the graph, there is uh, pretty significant uh, variability in terms of the level or percentage of obese children um, in those prospective places. And I think that that points to an interesting idea that um, research specific to a country 
needs to be done, and it needs there needs to be more research in order to understand country-specific um, interventions that are being implemented in order to combat childhood obesity. With that being said, the general trend has continued to increase over the last four or so decades. An interesting paper done in 2017 kind of indicated that from 1975 um, to 2016, there's been a steady increase. Um, 1975 to 2016, there's been a steady increase. Um, they pulled over 2,000 population-based studies, which uh, ended up looking at the BMIs of over 31.5 million children. And like I said, the standardized mean BMI has continued to increase at an interesting rate, <coughs> at an increasing rate. And although the graph may not be as striking um, in terms of the trajectory, <coughs> if you look at the numbers that are behind the graph, it was estimated in 1975 that there were about 14 million <coughs> children that were obese. And today, or in 2016, it was estimated that that number has grown tremendously to about 124 million. So that's well over 100% increase um, over that time period. But if we look at Chile specifically, um, and understanding how it compares to other high-income countries, um, it, it sits up on the top of, of kind of that, <coughs> that cohort. It's all the way to my right here, um, standing at about 44.5% or 44.5% of children. And this is measuring both obesity and overweight, so both one and two standard deviations above the mean. This graph is a little, is a little limited, I must admit, um, as they're taken among various ages. Um, so Chile, this number is rep representing people <coughs> or children of the age of 13. Um, and, but in general, uh, each country has a population that is somewhere between 5 and, and 19, um, which is kind of the population that I'm interested in, in conducting my research on. So, understanding that this has been the general trend over the last couple of decades, what is the driving force behind um, an increase in childhood obesity um, worldwide and specifically in Chile? And social scientists have kind of deemed this as an epidemiological transition, which is characterized by a few phenomena. The first being a change in terms of the population uh, um, composition. There is a, a shift in age distribution from younger population to an older population. We see that similar trend in the United States as well. In addition, in addition, uh, there's also a change in terms of the pattern of mortality. So this includes increasing life expectancy and also a reordering of relative importance of different causes of death. Essentially, that means that there's been a shift from uh, more traditional infectious diseases like HIV and malaria to more chronic non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, uh, hypertension, heart disease. Chile uh, kind of demonstrates an advanced uh, transition, um, and social scientists have kind of determined that there are two main factors that are uh, the cause of this. The first being rapid modernization and economic growth that really got going in the 1990s and has since progressed further. And that's led to an increase in a, a Western diet, um, usually characterized by being high in fat and high in uh, carbohydrates, which are sugars and a predominance of fast food consumption. And of course, many of us know that that's not always the healthiest option. In terms of urbanization, um, Chile was already an urbanized nation in 1960, but has since continued to increase. And um, the, the co-location of people in urban areas is up to 87.6% present day. And that's, that's led to an increased sedentary lifestyle and a decrease in, in daily activity. That's depicted by um, this interesting graph over here by the Ministry of Health and Housing and Urban Planning um, that a majority of the population is located in a few major cities um, throughout Chile. So together, all things considered, this kind of works as like the perfect cocktail, so to say, for increasing childhood obesity at a relatively alarming rate in Chile. However, what drew me to Chile um, is that over the last decade or so, there has been uh, an interesting, um, or a good amount of interventions that have been implemented uh, to kind of combat childhood obesity from a public health standpoint. The first and most notable that you'll probably see during your time here is the, the front of package labeling system. Um, that's indicated over here. And you see that um, for items that are high in sugar, fat, salt, and sodium, or sugar, fat, salt, and calories, um, they're kind of uh, deemed with a, a kind of like a stop sign, a black stop sign, 
that gives consumers, you know, a second thought about whether or not they should buy this product. Interestingly, any item that has one of these stop signs on them are restricted from being sold within uh, schools. And also the marketing of these has drastically, uh, has been restricted drastically as well. If you look just, you know, um, at the bottom of the screen, you see that Trix, for example, we all know the Trix Bunny very well, I'm sure, has been changed to a more plain imaging to kind of deter children um, in terms of their interest to buying these products or convincing their parents to buy these products. In addition, there's been integrative public health programs such as Vita Sana, um, which I'm kind of interested in exploring a little bit further, which is kind of like the promotion of healthy eating and um, increased uh, healthy lifestyles in general. And lastly, there's been a number of fiscal measures on sugar-sweetened beverages over the last decade or so um, that kind of provide tax breaks to companies that are decreasing their, uh, I guess, their uh, content of sugar below a certain threshold. It's decreasing 13% to about 10%, which is pretty significant in terms of like the industrialized world. So all this considered, I, I have a bunch of questions. First, if the public health sector was responding so robustly um, to this idea over the last decade or so, how has the treatment of childhood obesity shifted from a clinical perspective? Of course, as an aspiring physician, that's something that I'm interested in. How are people being, uh, and, leading, and that leads to my next question, kind of how are medical institutions updating methods on effective counseling regarding healthy eating and physical activity? Because that kind of directly combats the um, kind of like the perfect cocktail is saying for the increase of childhood obesity. Additionally, how has the rate of referral, has the rate of referral um, to subspecialties increased? And by subspecialties, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about GI, gastroenterology, nutrition, bariatrics, and even endocrinology. And these are subspecialties that usually work um, with populations that are um, more obese or overweight. And finally, how are physicians considering regional and socioeconomic differences? Um, as confounding factors. The distribution for uh, uh, obesity in Chile is disproportionate and it affects people of so lower socioeconomic standing as well as rural populations at a higher rate. So besides the fact that I'm interested in being a physician, why am I looking to evaluate physicians? Um, and there's a couple reasons and that physicians and particularly primary care physicians are in a unique position to advise patients in healthy uh, on healthy diet and exercise routines. <coughs> Prior research has indicated that um, kind of structured counseling programs had a, particularly delivered by primary care physicians in conjunction with dietitians has proven to increase uh, the intake of fat and uh, improve BMI over time. And Chile already has a strong public or a strong primary care sector. How can the, all things considered that um, increase the uh, I guess, uh, the success rate of those uh, programs such as VSAN that are being implemented. So in terms of methodology, uh, I'm keeping it kind of vague at first because I still um, have some talking to do with my affiliate who's currently in Germany and she said we would talk when she gets back so I look forward to that conversation soon. Um, but in general, I like to do observ observational studies um, in terms of how primary care physicians and also secondary health care providers are working with patients and their families and, and counseling them. And I also want to look through kind of like a comparative lens as well um, in terms of understanding how, that how that's different between urban and rural populations. In addition, I hope to do an in-depth qualitative interviews, a couple in-depth qualitative interviews, um, understanding how um, the teaching has changed in terms of from the perspective of course instructors and how primary health care providers also, you know, trained then over the past 10 decades, 12 or not 10 decades, uh, two decades um, has changed in the tra trajectory, tra trajectory of that training. Um, and these are my acknowledgments. I'll be working at Catolica, um, Dr. Maria Hodgkins, and um, I'm thankful for my home institution, Dr. Mayu Gardner, was kind of, I had a unique relationship with her because she was not only like the Fulbright mentor, but she was also my pre-health mentor. So we've been doing a lot of celebrating recently. Um, and then I'm thankful for the Fulbright for giving me this opportunity to conduct this research.